Live from New York. It's Thursday night. No. It's All right, Thursday night. We, are, we are yeah, we are live. Um, so wanted to uh welcome you all in to this is Tales from the Tavern. I have a really great group of people with me t uh tonight. I say that every week because every week it's true. Um I, <laughs> I know I I sound like a, a broken record sometimes. Um but uh, I'm gonna, without any further ado, I'm gonna go around and let everybody uh, introduce themselves. Just tell us uh, who you are and a little bit about um, what you do. Um, so let's, uh, David, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> All right, hey, am I, am I alive? Am I good to go? You are. Oh, okay, hello. <laughs> hello everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is David Tilstra. I, uh, yeah, I'm the DM for From Afar Podcast. And that's about it. I do other stuff too, but that's the most important and the only reason we're all here. So anyway, that's me. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Red, I'm going to go to you next. Hi, my name is uh, Red or Chris, whatever you want to call me. Uh, I play Kaka on Discount Dungeons, uh, fifth edition real play podcast. Uh, I also do the editing for it. And uh, yeah. Very nice, very nice. Uh, Doc, you next. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Doc. Uh, I am a part of one show on this uh, this very channel, uh, Neural Nexus Zero, on Mondays. Feel free to check that out, along with a uh, good buddy, Cycle Jack, will introduce himself later. Uh, other than that, I'm, I just like to play tabletops very casually. I'm a cute student, and... A stream occasionally so feel free to hop over and check that out whenever i decide to be live and <laughs> just excited to be here nice very nice uh ty how about you uh, well hello there everyone i'm ty barris creator of aether and steamworks a ttrpg that we play over at dice tyrants uh i'm also the gm there for a game we call silver shield it's a fabulous aether punk wild west adventure thing and i'm in a couple of games there with dice tyrants as well chronicles of kine and uh savage world of darkness the collective which is also a lot of fun um i'm an artist and a streamer and a ttrpg nerd and just a all-around yeah guy so <laughs> that's me yeah, all around guy. yeah guy but all, all around right. yeah guy I, I, I say yes to a lot of things so that's all i'm saying <laughs> fair enough uh cyclone jack how's it going uh my name is cyclone jack or jack or cyclone whatever you want to call me i'm a uh, full-time streamer here on twitch i'm uh, a competitive mech pilot and competitive overwatch player um i'm also a cast member of two shows on this channel the first being the tabletop tavern um as well as uh, neural nexus zero where i play uh, gunner and zero respectively and uh, it's nice to be here again. It's my second time on the show. I know. I'm excited to have you back. <laughs> Yay. And Ooh. for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Luna, Gamer Mom Luna on all social media. And um, I am the community manager for How I Nerd. I am also in uh, also in two shows uh, here on the How I Nerd. Well, three shows, including this one, but two um, Pathfinder campaigns here on How I Nerd. And then uh, another also in the savage worlds of darkness with ty um over on the dice tyrants on monday nights and um <laughs> yeah i i keep myself pretty darn busy with all of that stuff so um yeah so welcome on in you guys um i'm very excited to have you all here some of you are totally new to our channel some of you have been here before and um i'm really glad that you all were able to make time to be here tonight um so i'm gonna just a uh, couple of things for chat um chat we do take questions from chat so if you have a question that you want to ask anybody feel free to drop it in chat um i'm in chat you know i might catch it or, or hopefully one of our mods might be able to catch it as well um and we will make sure that that's something that we can all talk about so um you know feel free to to post comments questions anything like that um and uh yeah, and also for everybody else, um, you know, like I said before, we went live. You feel free to ask each other questions, and um, you know, go with go with whatever comes up. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start the ball rolling because inevitably this question always comes up, and and I warned you all that it all come, it always comes up. Do your dice have to match? <laughs> Probably the most important question any of us will get asked in the next week. I would imagine. It's true. <laughs> it's a it's great true. question. Mm -hmm. um for uh, for me uh absolutely and they 
actually also have to match whatever character I'm playing at that time. <laughs> I have so many sets of dice. It's it's a problem. It's a real real problem. But uh, yeah, I so can relate the, sh- to that. the short answer is yes. <laughs> so from my perspective, unfortunately, I have to, I have to disagree with you wholeheartedly. And the reason being is that I played Exalted. I played Exalted for a very long time, which is a White Wolf game. It's basically like the progenitor to the world of darkness as it existed. And uh, it's more of like, Such it's like game. if anime was on steroids <laughs> and was mixed in with werewolves and stuff. So you have these bags of dice that you're rolling D10s up to like 50 of them. And who wow. the hell has 50 of the same colored D10s? <laughs> So when you really want to, <laughs> I do. <laughs> so so yes, yeah, I, I, uh, I do enjoy having a multitude of different colored dice, and I do collect them, and I love all of them differently, and I obviously put some of them in prison when they don't roll well. Uh, but but for GMing, red, always red, always really? death, always things that scare the hell out of my players. <laughs> and I roll it, and look at it with the big eyes, and I'm like. Oh no! How am I gonna write you out of this one? <laughs> is that why your uh, your dice behind you is red to try to scare us? <laughs> <laughs> it's a power. That's what it is. He's the trying to intimidate us. The all. GM compels you to fear, <laughs> cower before me, fools. More. I I have to agree with Ty, but for a different reason. Not because I have um I don't care for my background. It's because I only have a couple sets of dice because i like my fancy dice um so i have like some hand carved wooden ones and Ooh, i have nice. some ones made of exotic materials that i use um i do have some cheap like chessex ones but my okay. dice don't have to match mostly because they can't Can but, I uh, say, without ever having looked at them that i want your dice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right now all just on that description man and can I ask you, um, you said exotic materials, and that sounds very <laughs> exciting. What 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 exotic materials? Like dragon bone or pure magic? Or... Yeah, have, pure yes, magic. exactly. Dragon bone. It's real. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I have a uh, dice made of, uh, of bloodwood, which I think is from South America. Ooh. Oh, wow. And that's a full set. I have a D20 made with uh alligator jawbone filled with holy resin. cow and it's like wow. green and white it's very cool um you know i have some metal dice just made of different metals and stuff like that um but yeah the wood ones in that gator jawbone one are my are my babies uh, like le- legit exotic materials i'm impressed and i fear you now so <laughs> very cool i am a fan mm-hmm. so um, much, much yeah, like uh red um i do have a lot of exotic dice but for certain games, they have to match. Like, I know, Ty, you're talking about Exalted Man, and I'm an old school World of Darkness player. And I'm that cat that when I found out I was playing Exalted, or I was playing um, Scion, or I was playing in a new World of Darkness game of any kind, I went out and I bought three sets of dice back when I was working with my old jobs. And it was 30 or 40 D10s of the same type. <laughs> I I had wished that I had had the ability just to go out and get the specific because we have some of the old uh, exalted solar dice that are like black with gold speckles mm-hmm. and stuff that all look exactly the same. The mage yep. dice and all that. Oh man. Um, but yeah, m- much like Red says, I have a lot of other dice that are you know exotic and really cool. Um, I had a friend of mine that uh, he actually went out and for Christmas one year he got me two sets of the full like D D style you know the d20 the d10 d12 all nine yards of uh of bone dice now he he told me they're like human bone <laughs> i don't know if it's 100 percent true it could be like animal bone or something like that I don't know. but they're bone dice they're really kind of cool and i always keep those around they're but one of my favorite sets uh nice. the only other set that you'll really find me play tabletop with is uh depending on where i'm at i have a, a dice tray that i carry with me and they're pewter they're all pewter. They're custom cut Ooh. and inlaid and, and and carved, and they were they were a pretty penny. But uh, I got those from a, a, an old friend a long, long time ago. That's if something I've never pain. something I've never gotten to get. Actually, was metal dice of any kind. I would love to have some of those solid or some marble ones. You know, yeah. that have that heft, that yeah. weight to them. I don't have those. I will say the, the only the, problem is if you drop those metal dice and you miss your tray, <laughs> and they hit your DM's table. The amount of glare that you get shot across the table at you 
could probably crack one of those dice in half. I'm fairly <laughs> certain that the reason I've never gotten the metal dice or heavy dice is because of that. We used to roll on glass tables. Our, our oh. coffee table in the living room was glass. It's like, Shit. I know that my, my wife would have been like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. No bread uh, in our freaking yeah. this, this, this is uh, this is great. I wanted everyone else to go first because now I get to play devil's advocate. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of my dice collection started when I was playing Magic: The Gathering. Oh, okay. Which means I have a lot Counter. of very random dice. I used to like go to the store and they had a, like a bucket, mm -hmm. and you would just like take a handful to the. Like, it was just like buy Sir. ten, and there was just like assorted dice. So Sir, I, I <laughs> you have cheated for a long time without realizing it. You know how many magic dice are not weighted prop properly so that they're balanced. Uh oh. Mm. Yeah, that's accurate. Twenty <laughs> spin oh, down. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 don't, I, don't use the, I don't use the spin downs. Ran, ran, it has to be a random d twenty. Uh, uh. <laughs> but yeah, like it's normally just a bunch of d sixes. Yeah, like the 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 actual magic issued uh, d twenties. I, I don't play with them. But yeah, like I used to just buy d10s and d6s by by the dozen and just because this is it's partially spite now because everyone gets at me for it and i'm just like let me play how i want to play i i come i come to the, the 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 session open a just dump a big bat a dice bag full of dice and just pull out a random handful and sit in front of me <laughs> I mean, they're, all, they're all like different colors and shapes. There's probably like four D like D twelves that I will never use. I actually have a I have a box just like that. Um, I got a gift at one point when I was younger. I was I used to smoke a pipe, and um, I got an old uh, cigar box that was like inlaid and carved and really beautiful. But I had no use for it because I stopped smoking almost as soon as I started smoking, mm. <laughs> and uh, I, I ended up turning it into a dice box. And now it has like sixteen different types in there. Okay, so you know. You know. But yeah, like even even to this day, like when you, like I've seen people with like bookshelves laden with these nice little sets, and I just don't. Every time I buy a new set of dice, I just dump it into this bag I have. <laughs> oh, that and just it gets makes people me so angry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brown Royal I love bag. the chaos. I love it. I love my dice. Chaos. My dice are all in a dice bag or assorted dice bags because I have like five or six of them, but they're all in cases. <laughs> so I have a question for you guys. Old school D role players, whatever. Some people didn't always have access to tokens and things. Did you ever use like those little tiny D sixes or the little fish tank glass things as the your tokens games. or characters or counters? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Like I said, I, I played Magic the Gathering. I am very familiar with using D sixes as tokens. <laughs> <laughs> the the little white and or the clear and the blue glass dots. Yeah. And then the, blue, the D and D yeah. dual cases or the Magic dual cases. You mean plus yep. one plus one counters? <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's what well, we are. know who our resident Magic the Gathering. Yeah. Player. <laughs> and I still have a ton of those, and I used to use pennies too. Pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Mm -hmm. So I when I first pennies. started playing, I I haven't been playing. I've only been playing for I say only. It's been like thirteen years now, <laughs> and um. When I started playing, I didn't have any minis, so we would use the um, the figurines that would come in the um, the tea boxes. The um, what's the name of that brand? Red Rose Tea that you could buy at the grocery store. So we would have like a bunny with an Easter egg and a treasure <laughs> chest and like all of these weird random. Those were our minis because my wife keeps those things. We have about a yeah. thousand of them on our windowsill in front of our sink. We um we had a treasure. I think I still have the treasure chest one because that makes for a great, you know, just having it out and be like, oh, there's a treasure chest right there. No, it's a mimic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always the way it goes. <laughs> always the way it goes. Um, we did have a couple questions come in from chat that I want to throw mm. out to you guys. Uh, the first one actually came from Mike from How I Nerd, and he wants to know what you guys think about um on a uh skill check. Is a one an automatic failure and a twenty an automatic success or no? Hmm. I'm very opinionated about this, so I'll. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, as, as someone who has probably DM'd a lot more than he plays, uh, one should be. I think one should always be a fail. Twenty should never automatically be a success. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. people people will use a twenty to justify their ability to do anything it's like hey i want to lift that house i roll the 20 i do it yeah no that's that's physically impossible 
<laughs> uh, but then, like on the I other mean, spectrum, like, it is. yeah, like one one should always be a fail, but it's it's always dreaded because a lot of DMs take it too far. Like, oh, you're chopping vegetables, you roll the one, you cut off your hand mm -hmm. uh, instead of you know, like, oh, you nick your finger. Why not? Yeah, that was like actually one of the first times I DM'd. I was I was playing for my little brother, and I. I didn't know what I was doing back then. I still don't know what I'm doing today, so I don't know if I've grown very much. But um, there was a lot of runs rolled in that game, and every single time I had them take damage, like no matter what they were doing, they would take mm. some damage. And by the end of it, he was just like, "He's like, yeah, I get what um, I get what you're doing. We were failing. This is true, but also we were like almost dead like that entire time. So maybe slow up a little bit. But yeah, it's I think sorry to kind of segue into that. I think it's so uh it it just depends on the situation like i think i, I tend more to yeah. uh to, uh do what doc is doing where at one it's not gonna happen you might not get hurt you might fall on your face your pants might fall down whatever but like whatever you're trying to do isn't gonna happen but yeah a 20 isn't yeah like i think in one of the one of my recent episodes we were doing someone tried to jump they were in a little raft next to this big like pirate ship and the guy's like i want to try and jump from the raft up to the top of the pirate ship i'm gonna roll for it and i was like okay go for it and he got like a 25 or something and he's like did i make it and i was like absolutely not what are you trying to do you're on a raft trying to jump up like 45 <laughs> feet and he's like okay i guess you're right and i was like yeah okay cool let's let's keep moving so from, my, from my perspective perspective devil's advocate here mm -hmm. um we're playing games one that are fantasy two that are heroic fantasy you want to be a good powerful mm -hmm. whatever individual you don't want to be an ordinary person yourself and there's magic everywhere Who's to say that when you roll in at 20, something doesn't occur that's just a little bit beyond? I don't necessarily advocate for the idea that you always succeed, always fail, but I do believe that you should have some success at what you're trying to accomplish, as long as you have a Absolutely. goal in mind. If a character's like, I want to do this thing just to do this thing, there's no point in actually accomplishing it. There's no reason to accomplish it. But if mm -hmm. you have a reason, my friend is trapped, the house just fell on him, I want to lift the house to save him. You roll in that 20... I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to say mm -hmm. you get a critical success. In my game, everything is critical. Successes or fails on a 1 or a 20. Um, so maybe you don't lift the whole house, but you lift a section. You lift just mm -hmm. enough. They're able to get out from under it, and it's a Herculean feat, like the woman that lifts the car to save her child, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. On a 1, on I... a one, that doesn't necessarily mean you fail. In my games, it means something happens that's negative. Whether mm -hmm. that means you still open the door but on the other side of the door is a soldier holding a gun or a sword or whatever. Um, versus uh, we had one character in a one shot we ran, the last alarm, who was trying to sneak through this city. He's a, it's basically think World War One. He's trying to get behind enemy lines. He's surrounded. He's a sniper. And he rolls a one on his stealth roll, but I let him roll again to see how well he is sneaking around the other people. There was a, a powerful wizard type that found him because he, he crit failed basically on his role in the following round. And then he had to deal with that occasion with that circumstance afterwards. So That's super interesting. I, I mostly agree with doc and David. Uh, the only caveat being, I don't consider a one always a failure. If you're a rogue that has like a plus 30,000 to stealth <laughs> and you roll a one, all right, you did the worst you could do at stealth, but you're the best person at stealth. So that still means mm. you're probably okay to move the average person, you know. But I mean, you're already, you're, even, if you're, even if you're amazing, there's still a chance you could screw up. You know, there's anybody, yeah. even people that have been weightlifting for 10,000 years might do it one time <laughs> wrong and blow something. Because it doesn't yeah. mean that just because they're really good at it that they can't fail. I mean... Yeah, sure, but you have a 5% chance of rolling a, ro a 1. That's not that's, indicative of the 1 in a million times yeah, you screwed that's it up. that's the one thing uh, I want to bring up. Like, when, I, when I was DMing, I, I liked it a lot better when I was using this D100 system, mm. where it was, uh, it was like 100 was a success, critical success and 1 was a critical failure. And what you could do is you could bring those in with, uh, like a, uh, I think it was your luck, so if you had a higher luck, you had um, you had a you had a lower you had a lower uh critical fail chance and then a higher critical success chance. And I just like that little margin of being well, able to have it just a little less thinking, percentage. You're absolutely giving the option of having less of these potential chaotic events to occur, right? Mm. But that, again, I, that, again, that depends on what kind of game you want to play. If you're in something where you're going to make a ton of rolls already, that five percent chance starts showing up more often. 
Um, if you're playing a game like Savage Worlds, as an example, or Aether and Steamworks, you have mechanics in play that allow you to reroll. Uh, so even if you get a critical failure, you can say, well, I'm going to use this Ace. I'm going to use this Benny. I'm going to reroll so I don't actually get that. Uh, Savage Worlds has the, the double one roll where you can't reroll at all, but you know that, that still stands. If you have an option to change your outcome, then maybe allow the chaos to thrive. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I can I can definitely see that if it's if it's a chance, then yeah. So I have a uh, a slightly different view. Um, it, it's been a little while, but I I used to run a lot of tabletop games, and I believed in the the rule of the campaign setting. One of the first things I did when I thought up a campaign is I sat all the players down and I looked at them and I go, "Do you want an epic setting, or do you want a normal setting?" Now, in a normal setting, I totally agree with half of what people are saying. A 1 isn't always a fail, and a 20 isn't always a success. But in that epic setting, that epic cinematic Michael Bay anime <laughs> setting, yes. the 1 on like a, a, a rogue with like a plus 20 stealth check, which still gives them a 21, lets them sneak carefully into that alleyway and as they're like moving from shadow to shadow and no one sees them because even still with that one they've got this amazing role they stumble over this pebble and they do this like tactical tuck and side roll and they manage to sneak underneath this like foray of covers and guards still turn back to look in their general direction because they kicked this pebble and they might have the chance the character doesn't know if they've seen them or not and on the converse, like with your with your pirate ship story, um, if they're going to roll that 20 and they're going to get that nat 20, even if they've got like only like a plus one to strength to like reach out and grab something, maybe something epic and cinematic happens. Like while this like huge splash buckling fights going on, someone knocked the edge of a rope off. So they get this like epic leap and they're flying through the air and all of a sudden there's this rope right in front of their face and they grab it and they may not make the full 40 foot leap, but they're 20 feet off the off the rope and they've got this rope in their hand and they're no longer on the boat anymore just because it's got to be that epic type setting he like leaps that. through the air and a dolphin ladder appears out of the water <laughs> there you go, there you go. Like wow I man you just, you just spoiled the story that's what happened right? it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful like, moment like i said man it's it's, it's all dependent on the setting and what the characters want to play do yeah. they want to be the hero or do they want to be an underdog that becomes the hero yeah. I, I so tend I, to read I, stories, and that's that's where my perspective comes in on the ones and twenties. Is because when I run a story, it's like a TV show for me. For the characters they're playing, my players are the stars of the show, and they should be able to do crazy cool stuff because it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to get more more gritty, if you're trying to play a more realistic campaign, then I definitely believe that the rules should be tapered back. Yeah. Um, so that's a, is key. Yeah, yeah, I like those perspectives. I might change my my mind moving forward because those are good answers. Yes, <laughs> yes another conversion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um. I'm, I'm <clears throat> kind of scrolling through the chat while you guys are talking. I I don't DM, so I don't have a huge stance on it. Um, but I like hearing what other people have to say about it because I'm always like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. And then I hear somebody else, and I'm like, oh yeah, that totally, makes, totally sense. makes sense. Um, and uh, you know, chat has a lot of you know they're taught you know rule of cool and you rule know all of, cool, of that yeah. stuff you know the um there's a lot of uh of good you know sort of variations on whether yeah. or not a one is a success or a failure and i think you know like everybody says you kind of have to go with my thought really is you have to go with the setting that you're that you're playing in so yeah it plays a huge so. part in it i think yeah. absolutely yeah. with the with the rule of cool i think that's a, that's a different thing for me slightly is like if if someone, if one of my, if one of my players comes up with like a really creative way, a really cool way to solve a problem, like I'm gonna, the, whatever, a million different options they could do to, to to slay the dragon or enter in the sneaky little alleyway or whatever. If they come up with a really cool way to do that, I guess mm -hmm. where where my stance is on that kind of thing is, I want to see that happen. So like the difficulty checks in my mind will just get lower. <laughs> so it's like you don't have to roll a nat twenty. Yeah, get advantage or yeah. you know whatever you want to do with that well that's there's some games that have that as a mechanic in them like exalted was one of those uh you get stunting so mm. when you do something that everybody around the table goes oh that is such a good idea yeah you get extra dice to roll so you know you have a better chance of actually accomplishing it i, I almost always have implemented that that's a really cool that 
that's I love rules that kind of bring the the table into the game or like things like that where it's like oh the group is just like yeah hell yeah so, all right cool here's three more <laughs> whatever dice yeah, to roll that's right, really cool you know what? get them involved get your players jumping for joy get them you know if you can draw if you can draw them to tears and if you can drive them to happiness and ex exaltation you're doing your job right as a gm yeah, that's, like, I mean, that's what it's about that's what i'm always looking for hell yeah dude yeah, yeah. definitely that's definitely. a great quote yeah that's a good question it is a good thank question. you mike yeah um all right so next question comes from uh everybody's favorite rogue shannon Hey. <laughs> what's um, up shannon she is hanging out in chat right now she wants to know how everybody got into uh ttrpg streaming and or podcasting another another great question ttrpg yes. streaming um so i had been approached by so many friends who wanted to <clears throat> you know back in the day start doing these big podcasts recording our tabletop games doing all this stuff and it all kind of fell by the wayside and i met mike i met mike back in the day over two years ago now almost two years ago and i was doing a uh a stream and he raided me after one of mine and mike and i became fast friends and uh he he was a variety caster who was mixed up in the mech warrior community ironically enough <laughs> and uh he looks to me eventually and he goes i'm gonna do a casting call and I want to swap my channel over and do tabletop role playing. You should apply. And I went, yeah, okay. And <laughs> one thing led to another. I threw my application in and eventually he called me up and he messaged me and he goes, dude, we got a slot. Are you interested? Do you want, do you want the last position? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm totally in. And, and the rest <laughs> was history, man. Like I, I, I'd been streaming and I never, like, I've seen a couple shows here and there of tabletop RPGs and I always thought they were really cool. And like I said, everybody in the past had always thought about it and wanted, you know, wanted to do it, wanted to put it together. And like, here's like my golden opportunity. I got my buddy, Mike, really freaking awesome dude. Very animated, very colorful, very, very knowledgeable. And, and everything that I'd seen on his streams was very pristine and the production was always like top notch. And I was like, if I can be part of this, this is awesome. I'm totally in. You know what I mean? And then just, it all just snowballed. Mike's been doing this amazing job fostering this community and everything and, and starting something up like this. And I was just like, I'm along for the ride. I love this. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, the beginning of our podcast was a little bit more uh, basic, I guess. Uh, our group had only just gotten together a, a bit for a little over a year now. And we started by playing uh, Dragon Heist. Uh, the campaign module and our Chris uh, Saint, who's on last week, ran that, and he was working on this homebrew setting uh, and campaign. And after we got done the Dragon Heist, he was just kind of like, "Hey, you guys want to like record this and make a podcast?" And the rest of us were like, "Sure, <laughs> why not? <laughs> why not?" <laughs> yeah. And then you know things started going, and you know here we are. Hey man, sometimes that's all that it takes. That's that's yeah. tight. Yeah. Well. My story was pretty much exactly like Jack's, um, only the difference with me was that I had never, uh, never streamed before in my life. Um, had no idea what I was doing. Um, but Mike put out the casting call and I was the only person uh, in the group that didn't, um, didn't uh, start by already knowing somebody else in the group other than mike um only having met through a facebook page that he manages um and so he put out the casting call and i would i had always been like eh, that would be kind of fun and and i was at the point where um you know in my life where i was looking for some new stuff to get involved in and and um you know try out some new things and i'd always really enjoyed uh, my my ttrpg games um, with my local friends so i was like yeah why not so i i put my name in and he reached out to me and the rest is kind of history and now you can't get me off the damn computer <laughs> as it should be right? welcome to the matrix right? seriously i'm just I, I think i'm slowly turning into a bunch of ones and zeros as i sit here you All are the one in their place <laughs> fantastic uh well uh for for us we don't um at uh, from afar, from afar podcast, we don't, we're not live stream. We've, we're talking about it just because 
the more we get deeper into this like uh, tabletop role playing uh, community, there's just a lot of really cool people that do stream. There's a lot of really great shows that do stream, and it's very inspiring to us. But uh, we just uh, we're just a podcast, and the way we kind of got into it was um, I moved out to Los Angeles uh, like five ish years ago now to uh, to try my hand at getting into the industry and becoming a filmmaker and uh it was, it, it was, it's pretty fun um but so when my first uh, my first little uh, first couple of years out there i was driving around a lot like i was driving trucks for different film sets and like picking up different camera gear and props and blah blah blah, blah. so i had a lot of time in the in my car so i got had to had a chance to listen to a lot of podcasts um and i started listening to uh, <clears throat> uh, the Adventure Zone and Critical Role, like the the ones that everyone everyone starts with, and I very much fell in love with like that whole scene, of just a group of uh, friends or family members like together, mm-hmm. just playing together, creating stories together, and I was like, man, this is this is such a special like real life magical thing. I really want to try and be a part of that. So I called up my little brother who lives back in Orlando. And I was like, hey, would you want to try to do something like this? And he was like, hell yeah. And so we, we did it. And we, me and him have both been involved with a couple of different improv groups uh, throughout like high school and college and stuff. And I was like, who else do you want to get a part of it? And we got our two other guys, uh, Christian Spinella and Goodball Maxson, to be a part. And so ever since then, we've just been honing the skill and practicing. And basically, the, the, whole, the whole point is we just try to make each other laugh. And <laughs> that's a... Uh, and we call it a day after that. So it's a very spark notes version of a, a very long story. <laughs> <clears throat> and mine's a, mine's a little bit of a personal nature. <laughs> um, so I've been a, a GM since I was 10 years old. I oh, wow. found my dad's Dungeons and Dragons books, the original first edition in the closet. I brought them out. I read them a whole bunch and immediately had them taken away. So I started creating <laughs> games of my own using Legos and little figurines, and I'd give them health tokens, and I'd make stacks that said, you have this much, and you have this much, and my brothers and sisters play. And uh, from there, I branched off into a, a lot of things. So I've been a, a storyteller. I've, been a, I've actually been a writer. I have multiple books that I've never finished except for one. Um, I have you cool. know, been GMing since forever. And... Um, no matter where you go, you know, sometimes you find that group, that niche group of individuals that comes and plays with you, and it's it's a blast, and you meet up every single week, and it lasts for a year, it lasts for two years, and then inevitably, inevitably life gets in the way, and it starts to taper off, and you go find something else. Uh, sometimes months or years later, suddenly you have a new group, and it's like, hey, let's play with them, let's play with them, let's play with them. So I had these kind of groups going on. I'm going through college, and um, I'm trying to get my degree at this point in time. I'm going in for computer sciences, uh, programming, and uh, network, that kind of stuff. And um, and a lot of problems get in the way, a whole bunch of them. Everything that could possibly go wrong has gone wrong, and I can't finish school. I can't. I can't go back. I can't get my degree. I can't even get my high school diploma because of some naming convention problems because my mom changed my name before uh, it, was, it wasn't legal. And uh, so I can't prove I have a high school diploma. Um, but I do, I do work on that. That's fine. No, but, the, but the story is that all this stuff happens and gets dropped on me at once. And I get into a position where my entire life is spiraling out of control. It's like, how do you get that control back, right? Create your own world. Um, that was the moment that I started writing my own book when I started writing my own TTRPG when Aether and Steamworks was devised. And over the course of one year, barely a year, I wrote the entire thing. It's 365 pages. Holy cow. Did all the art, did all the balancing, although I'm working on a 1.5 edition now that's better balanced. <laughs> more time to play test with everybody and stuff. But, but the concepts are there. And this was a lifeline for me. It was something that allowed me to have some semblance of control over my own life. Um, so I made this thing and I didn't know what to do with it. I'm trying to find anybody to look at it. I'm trying to sell it online. I'm trying to commercialize it, whatever. And I run into James with the Dice Tyrants on Twitter, on Twitter at one point. And he's like, Hey man, we're, you know, we're setting up this streaming community. We could always use more players if you want to get involved. And, you know, you have this game. Why don't you come run it on our stream and we'll, we'll work together. You know, you boost bolster us up with this new product. We'll bolster you up. Maybe we'll get some people to buy it, that kind of thing. And that went from a convenience of direction and turned into some genuine and very powerful friendships that I've had with the entire community. It brought back 
that sense of connectedness that I don't always have because when you're in one place, everybody's busy. When you're in this space, when you're streaming with everyone, when you're doing things on a weekly basis, when you're in, I communicate with these people more than I do my own family on Facebook or friends sometimes that are wow. living in the local space because for sure, mm -hmm. everybody's really, this is, this is my people, right? We're all between chaotic and and uh, lawful good, right in between there somewhere. <laughs> and, most of, um, most of us. Most of us. We have some <laughs> ideals that seem to align. Everybody wants the world to be a better place, and they like doing it through telling stories, or you know, the allegory of of the old tail spinner on the side that's trying to teach children how they should live their life. That is all of us while we do this all the time, and we get to actually bring these stories directly to people's houses, to to young kids, to old kids, you know, mm. to people that just want to escape the world for a moment and find something better and we get to create that for them and that's that's beautiful to me and that is the reason why i do this now so wholeheartedly i've jumped in with both feet and i will always try to create the best content i can that helps bolster people and make them love each other and love themselves you know it's our motto <laughs> yeah. that's awesome well, that's, that's it. Awesome. We can't follow that up at all. Yeah, so. right. Bye, right. Bye, yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Everybody have a great night. Okay. All right. I'm, <laughs> cool. everybody have a, I'm sorry. I ruined it again. Oh, no. No, no that, was, that, was fun. that was phenomenal. And it's it's really cool hearing that because, I'm oh, sorry, my chair's squeaky. Um, it's, there, there's, so many, there's so many really awesome stories like that in not just like um, uh, tabletop role-playing game communities, but just in like storytelling communities, like I, I do a lot of stuff of like screenwriting out in LA and the same thing, people are just trying to tell their stories and people are just trying to connect and find, find their tribe and find just a, 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 someone who can, who will listen to them. And it, it, that's really cool. I props for your story. That's, that's <laughs> what all of us are. That's what human beings are is a communal story being told over generations forever. And mm -hmm. we want to make sure that the right messages are out there for people. That's, you know, it's, it's been the way that all of us, for through through millennia have spread what humans are and that's that's also beautiful to me that's awesome good luck doc uh i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't even want to go after that <laughs> so the next question <laughs> sure it's, it's not as powerful as that and it's not very exciting anyway i swear i'm not crying i'm just sweating it's really hot in this room right i'm not crying you're crying <laughs> you're crying i'm just chopping <laughs> onions I'm just stop chopping cutting onions. those onions <laughs> damn onion those slicing ninjas drive by onion choppers yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, i brandish my fist at thee <laughs> I rolled a crit fail on my onion save. Uh. <laughs> so in that situation, uh. it would be just a flat out failure. Yeah, yeah just totally. Oh, you know, no. gum, the gum apparently gives you like a plus two or plus three. Sometimes glasses help. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. The glasses help because it hides it because it reflects like the lights and the yeah. screens. Yeah. And, the, yeah. the onions themselves turn away cowering at the magnificence that is glasses. <laughs> That's, That's what why. it is. Yeah, totally. Um, so, yeah, if you want to move on to the next question, we have a question from Knox Batty. Um, oh, what's up, Knox? <laughs> they would like to know, how deeply do you plan your PCs slash NPCs backstory when starting a new campaign? Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Oh. Sounds like he has some opinions on this one. Feel, oh, yeah. I feel like yeah, I'm going to be in the, in the minority on this one, just judging by the <laughs> communal grunt that just went out. <laughs> <laughs> There's two schools of thought that I abide by. One, a story has to be real, and it's got to be real to you in some way, shape, or form. Whether you take it from an epic, whether you take it from a anecdote, from a friend, whether you base it off of a character you've seen on TV or a movie or whatever else the case is, there has to be some sort of tie-in to make that character personal to the player. But the very same time as real and as special as that is to you there's an old adage that says every contact go or every well laid plan goes to hell the minute you make enemy contact <laughs> <laughs> meaning i formulate a character and i get into a character and and mike bless his goddamn heart dealt with me when i was putting together gunner i wrote this 
page and a half long story and then revised <laughs> it i think like once or twice and i finally sent it to him and i was asking him like 100 questions and he's like yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine dude it's great don't worry about it just go with it and it was this like i i'm not a big writer i'm not a, a very very smart man i just i get very passionate and very involved and very in-depth when i come to think of these characters that i get to personify and play and on top of it all i get to do it in front of a camera for people right so all this is is put together and and thought of and i want to relate to who i created and who i molded but at the same time i know that that first die is going to hit the pavement and things are going to change so i try to give myself a little bit of wiggle room so when that first die roll does hit i have a blueprint but not such a stringent one that there's no room for flexibility if that makes sense. So it'll be this big, big backstory and background, but I'll be slightly vague on certain character points and certain character aspects so that I can kind of roll with back and forth. So I put together this big page and a half background, but made enough flexibility so that when Luna and myself and Decider and Yachts and, and everybody else that I play with, I had the ability to adapt the character just enough that it was flexible to like the group. So that's that's kind of my opinion on it. Um, I, I I kind of agree with you, Jack, although I, I embrace the chaos a little bit more than that. Um, you said you have a page and a half of backstory. I usually write, like, a paragraph. <laughs> uh, maybe two. Uh, just enough so I have, like, a scaffolding. Like, I have a vague idea what happened in uh, his or her backstory. And then, as like you said, as the game goes, things will happen and it'll it'll develop like i didn't have a really good fleshed out backstory for kakal until like episode five six you know which is sitting out of the table for 18 hours or so at that point <laughs> um but you know i had a vague idea so i knew like what kind of personality he would have is generally type how he would react to things and then you know the uh, first first session we had i was like oh i guess he loves jerky i guess that's a thing now <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally got you and i totally understand I, i've dealt with and I've played with a lot of people that feel the same way. The only reason I do the way that I do and the, the amount that I write is as a DM as well. Ty, you might be able to back me up on this. When you hand a backstory to a, to a DM like this, the DM looks at it and goes, I can comb through this and add more to the story without having to write a goddamn thing. He's really given me information that I can make episodes off of. Yeah, there's there's a lot there that needs to be given for a GM in order to to put together a piece that makes your characters feel like they are really integral to your story and to the universe as a whole. If you are too vague with it, then everything has to be based off of these ideas of who your character is rather than who you think your character is that the GM has to make guesses on. Mm -hmm. They might they might build a scenario for you that is way outside what your character would actually deal with or do or whatever if your GM doesn't know who your character yeah. is now i don't i don't think that you should have a 10 page book backstory sure. <laughs> um but from my perspective a player that comes to, to the table with an idea of who their character is is very very strong for me so that i can write a story around them i can tie in oh you had this uncle 10 years ago that did this with you here's a scene with the two of you and here's why it's relevant in the future in episode 5 10 15 whatever um so yes and no, having that open. There's, there's one other aspect to that that I personally ascribe to. It's the idea that the perception of who you are as a character is very personal, but that's not how the world necessarily sees you, and that's not exactly what the uh, history of your character potentially is. You could have mm. said, I went into a burning building and saved kids, and society says, that idiot ran into that building while it was collapsing and barely escaped with his life there's a perception difference that can occur that you can write <clears throat> into as a GM. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely agree with that. Uh, I feel like every character needs to have some semblance because like, like you were just saying in, that, in my current 5e campaign, uh, my character had the soldier background, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, was a deserter. And now that the army that he deserted from has won the war and is starting to take over the continent again, it's starting to catch up. Like just the other session, we had someone sort of blackmailing me, saying it was like, "Oh, if you do this for me, I won't let it let people know where you are. I know that you won't let this catch up with you." And I feel like every character needs to have that sort of that 
had that ability for the the dm to pick something out maybe have um even if it's not like for a whole episode just something that you can pick on that character for or like if be it like a family member you have written or their backstory that's why the backstories are there but yeah like going going back to the original question is there's there's usually two trains of thought for that i see in people one is uh i have 5000 characters <laughs> And they will, they will just keep pumping up characters over and over and over again, even if they never play anyone. And then there's the people like me who will, uh, I don't have a backup character for any of my backup characters because that's how dedicated I am to writing the story and keeping that person alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that strays from like my very first campaign, which was um, it ran for like three years. And out of when we had people like come and go, we had characters die. And I was like one of uh, three people out of, I think, 11 or 12 total over the course of those three years that actually has still had their original character. Wow. That's nice. <clears throat> that's pretty cool. awesome. Very yeah. invested in the character. Yeah. And, and that, that's the part for like, I, I bring as long as a GM, like even if like people like, I will break the rules to keep people alive just cause I like telling those stories. Like I, I used to do a lot of writing that, that that's my strength. Like I'm no artist, but I can, I can write really well. I like to think so anyways. And yeah, like I, I always have a very good backstory for my characters, and I feel like everyone should have a little bit just for that DM to play with. And you were going about like perception, yeah, like it was like if someone gets in a in a car crash, people just say, "Oh, it's just an accident." Uh, happens all the time, and the person who maybe died in that was like a father, and that family scarred for life. Now it is that That's matter bigger. of perception that can really tell different stories and really help you like connect with some people like it, it's what keeps people sane is like both by not thinking about everyone that dies in the in an accident or and and the families that get left behind it's it's what keeps human beings sane and i, I feel like pr playing on that is a a really good way to write stories and just making sure that people when people get slapped with that reality it can really make a even the strongest characters crumble mm. That's you touch upon another idea that's very important for uh, successful campaigns, especially in our community when we're trying to drive a story forward. And that is character flexibility. If someone creates this, this is my character. This is what he would do. He will never stray from any of this or change in any way. You completely limit the direction that a story can go because in real life, every human is learning from every experience that occurs at that moment. And personal growth occurs only through challenge and sometimes difficulty and learning new things and empathy those things are what changes a person and if you're not willing to change them because your backstory says you know major the cleric would never walk into this church and fight these people because mm. they're also religious even though they're you know stealing babies uh, whatever it is yeah you have to be willing to to be flexible absolutely yeah it's super interesting <laughs> I find one thing not very me, wise in school. Like one thing for me that I've discovered that I do, and I I hadn't really thought about it until I was listening to to some of you guys answer, is um my so my backstory for the characters that I'm currently playing on streams, um I think uh, Ida Bricks is my character on Sunday nights, and her backstory was eh, not quite a page long, um and then. The backstory for um, my Wednesday night character, Evie, um, who is a ranger, she her backstory was a little over a page, um, but half of that was listing out siblings because she comes from an extremely large family. <laughs> um, but she but I left that like, you know, sort of very open ended, like, you know, she has she's one of, you know, like seven kids and she has six brothers. And here's where all of the brothers are like, but I didn't put like names of cities or things like that but like here's where they are and here's the type of relationship she has with them and so if they were to end up in a city that maybe one of or a town or village or wherever one of the brothers ended up like that type of re of um thing could play out sort of a little more naturally than if i just said you know this is where they live this is exactly what they do you know this is so there's that but the other thing that i was thinking about too is with my streaming campaigns, all of my characters have pretty significant backstories. Like, at least I kind of know what their motivation is. 
when I was playing with my local group, I never had a backstory. Never. <laughs> not once. Um, and I think uh, that I think part of that actually is the difference between the enjoyment that I would get out of playing some of these campaigns versus the ones that I was playing with my local group, because I never felt like uh, I knew why, like, what was my character's purpose for being there? I never had an answer for that. Um, it was always just, uh, she was sitting in a tavern and okay, off she goes, you know, <laughs> um, that's pro versus, you know, amateur yeah. hour. That's, that's what we're doing here is we're making shows. Yeah. You have a character on that show. Yeah. You know who yep. that character yeah. is. Right. Exactly. Mm. So, like yes. Yeah, so doing a lot Legendary. more, yeah, yeah, a lot more of that, uh, that in-depth work, um, for these, for these shows on these streams. But I think too, it also helps me better be able to play off of when I see another character say or do something, you know, it helps me better know like, oh, this is how my character would respond to that kind of thing, as opposed to just kind of being like, oh, this is my character, but this is how I'm going to respond to it. So that's how my character is going to respond to it. You know, it's it's a lot easier to get into my character's mindset. Uh, I, I, I do feel like uh, knowing your GM is also a good way uh, oh, yeah. of how you build your character. Definitely. Like, like for, for this, I, I know it's a show. I know Mike is probably not going to kill me within the first three sessions. <laughs> uh, probably. Don't kill your chicken. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I We've know. all made I, it I'm, past I'm our first high. three, so it's all... I ain't been shot yet, but yeah, like... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I just remember a particularly bad experience where I was... Um, I was uh, roped into a campaign uh, by a mutual friend. Uh, I never played with this dude before. Um, and it was uh, starts without number. For those of you who know the system, uh, mm -hmm. you know how brutal it is. For those who don't, it's a very brutal system. <laughs> uh, and I remember spending a long time making this nice character. A uh, couple days, we the DM and I worked on it, and I think like three sessions in, four sessions, we weren't even past level one. Uh, total party wipe. TPKs are common and yeah. starts with a number, especially yeah. for GMs that are not super yeah. careful. And it, it, it was a real shame because like he was just like rolling a random counter table. Oh great, you get killed by space spiders. <laughs> yep. Dang. Space and, spiders, man. Yeah. And I was just like every time. I was I was just staring at like my my notes and all my work and I was just like <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, like take the next character yeah, off the pile. So, like uh, <laughs> that's why I like to learn my, learn my GMs, and that's how much effort I put into my character. And at the same time, going being as a GM, uh, like I said, I have all these uh, very venerable characters that have survived a lot of uh, encounters. That backstory is now like seven pages long. I can use that in a lot yeah. of my campaigns. <laughs> well, you have legitimate history within the game too, so there's a yeah. lot of a lot of contacts. You know, that's what that's what Luna was doing with her backstory was immediately sewing contacts out into the world mm. that she can go to for information. Yep, that's totally what it was. <laughs> nothing, I, I love nothing more Medic in my GM me. campaigns than bringing in parties from my my old campaigns or parties I've played with. And old characters I made. It's it's my favorite thing. Just because I because I awesome. played them for so long. Like mm -hmm. like that first campaign. Like I said, I played it for three years. I know every single character in that campaign, how they mm -hmm. act, and uh, and how they how they would say things. And I could and I just love cross porting them into different worlds or uh, just having them be part of uh, the same world, but as a party that has gone off and done this thing. And they've just been heard about in stories, and it's it's just one of my favorite little tropes to do as a DM. That's yeah. awesome. Well, that that's that kind of brings up something I've been talking about with, uh, some of my players recently is like the idea of like front story, not like backstory is definitely important, and it's like it, that's backstory is where your character comes from, but like front story is what happens to your character in the world that you're experiencing. Because like, you can say this like this f fancy crazy backstory and have all these details, which is great. I think that's very necessary, but like especially when we're doing these live streams and like, like podcasts and stuff like the stuff that happens on air, like that is the history. So like, once you can, like, once you can use that and mold that and bring that into the game and make those connections, like make those connections on air and then call back to that later. I think, I think that's just like the next level of it. Cause I think if you kind of what uh, Cyclone and Chris were saying a second ago, like making backstories is like super important. 
but also building in that flexibility just to see what happens in that campaign. Cause like I've, I've been, I was, I was a DM in one campaign where one of my players wrote, <laughs> no joke, a 33 page backstory. He had a table of table of context. He wrote a language just for the backstory. And there was this like whole political system and everything. And I, I read it and I was like, Oh my gosh, dude, like this, this is amazing. Like, but this is an amazing book. Like, I don't, we don't need <laughs> so this. Why are you yeah. giving me homework to go play a no, game, man? Like, <laughs> you sent it to me and I was like, I, I can't read this. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so like that character, it, it was interesting because in that campaign, it actually, because his backstory was so structured and so stringent and it was, it was very good. He kept being like, hey, when are we going to go like get to, get to my home world? When, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do that? And like, when we got there, it just sort of like enveloped everyone else's story and it just turned into his story and i was like that's really interesting like you gotta find that balance basically of like plan it out but also definitely have that flexibility of what happens at the table becomes reality and that that's what you get to play off of and i think it, it's kind of fun gm and player balance is so so critically important to a good ttrpg session you making sure that nobody ever feels left out mm -hmm. making sure that you're not playing favorites with individuals i i personally believe that nobody should be a lead character mm -hmm. in, the game mm -hmm. in particular yeah, because sure. there's more people around the table you know yeah it's a group yeah. a group storytelling yeah that's i mean that's maybe reason. Maybe they do have that one session where something really critical to their backstory happens you follow that Cool, that's great. But make sure you do that for everybody, you know? And then yeah, you get, sure. everyone yeah. gets their five minutes of fame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially, too, um, Ty, when you're streaming it or when you're doing a podcast, I would imagine, too, if you don't do that, and this is, again, strictly from a player perspective, if you don't do that, you run into issues of players sort of losing interest, wandering off, like, Absolutely. you know, they're just not going to pay attention professional, to what's going how yeah. unprofessional is that from a GM's perspective and from the player's perspective when they just glaze out because they haven't had the chance to say anything for yeah. 20 minutes or yeah. an hour or two hours? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, that's super relevant to our podcast because we have six players in it. So oh, yeah. it, it's it's a lot it's a lot e easier to avoid that if like three or even four. But once you start getting five, six, whatever, you really got to start watching the balance of who gets the spotlight and how so the biggest. The biggest group I ever tried role playing was seven players, and that was during the some of the betas of the game that I wrote. Um, I had a, one group that was three, that was the smallest, and one group that was seven, that was the largest. And oh man, that was a sh show. <laughs> <laughs> right, did you? Seeing you just cut out there. What did you say? I, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Words. Yeah. I said, that. Auto no. <laughs> I said <laughs> show. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it out the big language, Ty. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, it's it is. It can be really challenging. I'm I'm sure as as a DM to be able to balance some of that stuff, especially when you start something with a character and it's going really well and they're super into it and you're super into it, but then you have your other players over here that are like, um, hi, we haven't talked for 30 minutes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we're still here. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah, just... that that was uh one of my favorite things about the very first campaign I did. Uh, this is gonna like show my age. Uh, I was just like, I am a very young and my very first like proper campaign uh, was on roll twenty. Uh, and the good thing about having online systems like roll twenty <laughs> and uh, fantasy grounds is that while two people are talking, two other people can talk. You have you have text. Uh, like literally almost. Every sort of character interaction in universe was done through the the text chat in wow. in our roll twenty, and that was good because it let lot it let lots of people converse at once from like completely different sections of ev like from anywhere. And also, what it did was that it created a log of our entire campaign, <laughs> which I have on my PC to this day. That's, <laughs> That's amazing. amazing. That's awesome. It's That's like awesome. three million words. <laughs> Some of the differences, though, too, between streaming and home games, right? Home games often have a lot of side talk. They have either character interactions or personal, interpersonal interactions happening off on the side. When we're doing this, you can't oftentimes yeah. you can't talk when someone else is because no somebody's not hurt, just mm -hmm. flat out. Yeah. yeah so there's one -on -one. there's been a lot. There's a lot more attention yeah. to each other that happens. Yeah. And I think that, that that leads to people kind of buying into the game a little bit more, especially if they're engaged. 
Mm. I mean, you, you, you see everything that's happening and in a better way. Yeah. Also, I feel like on the, on the other side of the screen, like it's, I found for myself, it's a lot easier to watch a stream or to listen to a podcast when it feels like everyone's like there. Like yeah. I've, like, I've played a lot of home games with people on their phone, like looking up sports, whatever, or Instagram or whatever. But like when, when everyone's like focused on what's going on, it makes it really easy to just like, oh, cool. They're engaged. I want to be engaged with them. That's, that's psychology right there, man. Everybody uh, well. thinks it's interesting. So, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time just funny you brought up the just difference between online and home games because we well used to record our games in person, not right now. Um, uh, it was weird because, like, normally you would have all those side talks and side conversations going on, but because we're recording it, uh, you can't do that because then the recording gets all garbled and you can't yeah. tell what's being said. So it's kind of a weird catch twenty two where it's like people want to have side conversations, but they can't because the audio is going to be bad. And it's a it's an interesting balancing act for those that record in person. It does. Yeah. It's, it's a different form of etiquette, I think, that mm. starts to develop between people, especially as you've done long term. Sometimes mm -hmm. people know when to stop, and sometimes people get loud and they can't hear anybody else, and then then maybe they carry on a little bit longer or something. But it, it's definitely different. You you miss out on some aspects that the home experience provides. That that casual, silly side banter that can sometimes be funny, entertaining, or the show itself. Um, yep. Yeah. So it, you're right. It's a catch twenty two. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um... I think at this point, we're going to take a quick uh, five, 10 minute break, um, let our guests get up and stretch their legs and all that good stuff. Um, Joke's on you. I don't have legs. Hey, oh, oh, got him. Got him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I think we will do that now and um, hopefully Nick is back. I just texted <laughs> like Mike. Uh, <laughs> Mike. Mike, Mike. <laughs> I'll just um, mute my mic and hold still so it looks like it just right? froze. Well, I'll just be like. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, and, <laughs> and, while, <laughs> <laughs> and while we do that, um, I, I uh, do just want to point out um, for anybody in chat who may be new to TTRPGs um, or looking for some uh, new and different resources for TTRPGs, um, Mike did put a video up on the How I Nerd YouTube channel that lists out a bunch of, uh, um, you know, free resources or very inexpensive resources that are currently available um, for all, for everyone um, and how to find them and, and where they are located. Um, so that's a, that is a, uh, up on YouTube. If you want to go check that out during the break. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still waiting to see if Mike is here. <laughs> Mike, I'm stop probably, holding us captive. Right. <laughs> Mike, I gotta pee. I'm a prisoner. My beer is calling Let to me. me. My teeth are floating. <laughs> Basically, um, for the break, I'm just going to turn on my AC. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chat's now going, let them be. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, chat. Oh, my gosh. The true heroes. Let them pee. Let them pee. Oh. I, uh, <laughs> I do have a question when we get back, though. So yeah, definitely. Dope. It's a very one. deep and hard-hitting question. Oh, perfect. Um, we only, like that's exactly what I expect from you, David. Yes. <laughs> Got it. The answer, is, <laughs> the answer is yes. Purple, sometimes on a first date, and I prefer <laughs> Italian. <laughs> All right. Well, see, now I don't have to answer, ask the question. So thank you, Cycle. Well, good. You know, uh, said, <laughs> well, we, oh my God, now we've got hashtag free the pee. Um, <laughs> yes. Free us. <laughs> hey, no, hey, don't, 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 don't get too mad at him, chat, because he's, he's eating and it's probably very busy. delicious. He yeah. hasn't eaten in like a day or something. Yeah. 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 He's a busy dude. Um, Jack, I don't hey, do, know. If do he's... we want to do a question while we wait for him to get back and then? We can i do want to make sure that jack knows that um chat has called for him to come back on this show in a wrestling singlet oh, oh. <laughs> yeah you gotta do that man so i did why a, is that not happened yet I did, a, I did a so i did a fundraiser i do them every quarter i do fundraisers for uh for vets and first responders and that's awesome and active duty military and we met one of our goals one year and i i told them that since we met our one goal 
that I was going to do an entire stream in a onesie. (laughs) (laughs) And he did. (laughs) Nice. Way to hold up the people I know who have done that. (laughs) (laughs) I I even gave him a little flex and everything on stream. They were, they were, yeah, there were some disturbed images and people not sleeping that night, but you know, it happened. (laughs) (laughs) Lots of trips to the gift maker. Yeah, Coffin says there were no survivors. <laughs> I don't know. All did right, you just well, say? Oh. Go ahead. No, I, I was just about to ramble. I do that oh, a lot. Just cut I, me off always. I, I was just going to say that uh, Mike is back, so we are going to go to break so uh, we can hashtag free the pee. And, hashtag uh, free the pee. <laughs> Right, we have we have a very interesting chat. That big um, yes, that big and, uh, so go go check out that video on YouTube that I was talking about um, while you're waiting for us to come back. And uh, if you um, if you don't get to do that during the break, then you know check it out later. It's a really good video. Mike put a lot of work into it. There's a lot of great um, great resources there. So we will be back in five or ten minutes, and we'll see you then. He says we're going storm. now, so I think we're back. Yes, we're back. Okay, oh, <laughs> just making sure. Yay. I'm like, I'm going to sit here and stare for a minute. <laughs> All right, we are back. Welcome back, everybody, to the second half of Tales from the Tavern. Um, hope you all enjoyed uh, your hashtag free the P 2020 <laughs> break. Um, we did. <laughs> it was we glorious. All, we all did, yes. Um, and uh, so we are back now. And David, you wanted to ask a question of everybody. Yes, I did. Um, <clears throat> just because we were kind of talking about this a little bit uh, earlier, and uh, in the the community that I have around LA, this is a fairly de- uh, divisive divisive topic. Uh, how do you all feel about not uh, TPKs, but just killing players, players characters in general? Because I guess I can start this out. I I feel like for myself, whenever I'm running my games, it has to be for a very very good reason like i feel like like i feel like this was said earlier um the the players are the main characters in these stories and like it's kind of awkward if you're like watching a movie or reading a book and like say you're reading harry potter for example and like halfway through harry potter just stop being a player or a hero in that in that story so i don't know i think a lot of people have called me soft and not wanting to hurt my players because i i'm not not opposed to it i just feel like it has to be a very good reason to kill a a player in a in a tabletop role. So, what do you all think? I'm very opinionated about this, but I'll let other people go before me. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll go. Um, I'm not afraid to do so. I have done in the past. Um, I I kind of agree with David in that I don't want to kill them off willy nilly, um, unless you know. It also depends on the character you're playing with, right? If you're the DM mm-hmm. and you know your characters don't care at all, then you know you be kaye. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, if you're doing something longer form or doing a podcast or streaming, you know, eh, maybe you want to not do that. Um, so I think it's like most things is contextual, but I'm not afraid to do it. If it happens, it happens. I, pretty, pretty hard. <laughs> I've had a character that was killed <laughs> off, uh, in a, in a way that was, um, sort of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I guess senseless. Um, I mean, what's that? <laughs> 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 it was, uh, so this was in a home campaign several years ago, and I still to this day maintain, some some people have heard this story already, I still to this day maintain it's one of the deciding factors behind my divorce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Sorry. My ex-husband <laughs> was, the, uh, was the DM. And I, I, okay, let me preface this by saying that if your character does something stupid, then yes, you absolutely deserve whatever your character gets. Um, like that's my uh, that's my opinion. So, my character um, went in. Uh, she was the only one that was strong enough to open a sarcophagus, and they were in this, you know, this room, whatever. So we we see that there's a sarcophagus in there. So of course, naturally, she's going to open it. She opens it, and out pops a vampire who casts Slay Living. <laughs> and it's like and that was it like it was there was no Done. nothing else i mean literally like if you could picture me flipping the table that's almost exactly what happened <laughs> um 
Yeah. I yeah, it was it was I mean, it was very poorly handled on my part, but it was my like I said, it was my ex husband who was the DM, so I was like, "You're sleeping on the couch tonight," you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know, jokes on me. The couch is more comfortable than our bed. So um, <laughs> yeah, but it was that was one of those things that I just felt was a very unnecessary thing to have happened to my character um, because I didn't. I, the way that I was looking at it was it was it wasn't something that was out of character. It wasn't something overly stupid you know we mm -hmm. wanted to know what was in the sarcophagus that was part of why we were there so um yeah i think if you're gonna kill off a character or if you're gonna if you're gonna go for the tpk there has to be a, a legit reason behind mm -hmm. it you know i, it I absolutely really nilly. i absolutely agree with that and i absolutely despise role-playing games that have uh abilities or or circumstances that occur that you have no chance against you don't get to roll mm. defenses you don't get to roll saving throws those kinds of things power words uh, that kind of stuff that you don't get to roll against is completely antithesis to the player mm -hmm. um you you lose all agency entirely Guar guaranteed hits should be very ineffective that's why they're mm -hmm. guaranteed if you're going for something big like that it has to be like one in like a d10 at best <laughs> Yeah. I would argue that we take that entirely out of the NPC's hands. PCs can use it because mm. there's a million enemies out there, and big yeah. boss guys already have legendary features that keep them from having it affect them. So the only person that it really screws over is the player, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Don't let and your also, NPCs have certain skills. If, like, a monster NPC dies, it's like, whatever, but, like, if a player dies, it's like, oh, shit, like... Yeah, that's that good. That goes that, the last year yeah. we played. Yeah. Yeah. So you wanna you wanna weigh in there, Jack? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I get confused. My name is also Jack. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack wanna weigh in? Boy, you fight. You know, fight over it. I wanna see. Fight to the death. <laughs> Roll <laughs> for it. Someone throw in a gladiatorial arena. <laughs> <laughs> That's very Batman of you or Joker of you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Doc, it's all you, man. You can start us off. Uh, yeah. Well, like I was saying earlier. Thank you very much, by the way. Uh, like I was saying earlier, I am very much a storyteller. Uh, mm -hmm. I am very loath to kill characters. I am not loath to maim characters. <laughs> uh, there is a difference. I, I, yeah, I, I have. You don't uh, have to kill them to torture them. Yeah, I have done <laughs> a lot of homebrew rules that uh, I have just put in place just simply because I didn't want a character to kill a character, like you know, cutting off their arm. <laughs> Like how how they, and and then they have like minuses to all their ability scores mm -hmm. and some of their skills until they like have a prosthetic and they get used to it and stuff like that. And I feel like that makes it more fun because you still have the same character that's been there for hopefully a year or so, and it, it doesn't just end there. And I feel like my sort of way of thinking translates over to how I play because. Uh, like I said, in my in my five E campaign that I'm currently playing, I have the beefiest druid known to me. <laughs> Is he? Uh, can he transform into a cow? Uh, I mean, he can, but he, I mean, he's a shepherd druid, so he's yeah. more more like summoning an army of cows. Uh, Angry but yeah, style. I think we're like level eight, and uh, I have eighty hit points <laughs> for a five E character. That's kind of insane. I think I have more hit points than our fighter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And it, it was really good, because I remember in one dungeon, we were level 7, uh, we came against this really good warlock, and my character got hit with Feeble-Minded Finger of Death at, at level 7. <laughs> and it was just like, spells like those at that level, it was like, if, if, I did, if I hadn't taken some feats and gotten really lucky with my hit dice, always roll your hit dice, people, it's so much, it's so much fun. Yes, uh, I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> uh... Yeah, I mean, he, the dude was like, DM was already rolling out. I was like, okay, so you're dead. You turn into a zombie. He's like, I'm not dead. I have like a 64 HP pool. There's no way that killed me in one hit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like the the instant death spells, stuff like that, they really have to be well-tempered. Whether it's like, I mean, if you're going to kill someone, kill the... Uh, Kill the party's NPC helper or their their, their pet pig oh, or something. Not God, ooh, <laughs> not the pig, man. Leave oh, bacon out of this. Yeah, that, 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 that was that was something that happened recently. Uh, we were we were on a caravan headed north, and uh, our one of our wagons got hit by a fireball, and it killed our our resident pig, Mister Winky. 
Oh no! And that 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 hurt our that hurt that hurt our barbarian more than any any fireball could. <laughs> What's well, I, I, I mean? I feel sorry. like that that's the way to do it. No, no worries. Um, yeah, like you you can hurt players so much more just by not killing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, killing everything around them. That's such a good point. It, like, it seems brutal, but I, I feel like that tells much better stories. I very much agree with that. It, like, it was like your players a rallying point. Like mm. they they weren't able to protect someone, or because of their actions, or because of whatever someone they were with died. It's like that's so much more dynamic and more exciting, and just provides better story and better play than just death. I, yeah. I, so I've I've been gaming and I've been playing for a very very long time, and as an adult and as a person, I've matured just as much as I have as a player in a game. Now, the beginning part of the story was when I was much, much younger. I think I was still in high school. Um, I swear I'm older than I look. <laughs> but um, some of you old hats may or may not remember, and I, I apologize for using the term old, um, a certain set of adventures, there was two of them, the Temple of Elemental Evil and Return to Temple of Elemental Evil. <laughs> and for those of you old school players, a shiver just ran down your spine. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> because. <laughs> so I had played in this adventure, and I had fallen in love with this uh, this module set, this thick ass book, right? And I remember what it was like, and I remember the unrelenting torture that my DM laid upon me, and he wasn't even trying. It was the way the book was written, and I remember the triumphant feeling we had as we. You know, we didn't even finish the, the adventure. We just escaped, right? Like, that was, it was that big. So um, I decided that I was going to run the game. And uh, this this shows, even through the adventure, how much I had matured. Originally, it was it was my players who were always coming at me going, oh, we're totally going to beat you this week. We got this. We're going we're gonna to crush this module. This is nothing. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. Come get some. I've got yeah. blueprints on how I'm going to smack the taste out of each and every one of your mouths. Somebody, <laughs> pass, them, somebody pass them out and do. We're going to get this on. Where's Mills Lane? Somebody ring the bell. The pass them out. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble. Exactly. The Mortal Thank Kombat team starts gems. playing. <laughs> yeah. Any, any, any sort of battle. Yep. So I was 18 years old, and um, in Temple, I had this one player who was always gung-ho <laughs> never listened to you know the warnings never you know searched for traps or did any of that he was he was your quintessential leroy jenkins he was your barbarian that just, <laughs> and he lost about like four characters right <laughs> so for return to temple a, a bit of time later when i decided to run it for the party um we had revisited small characters but his character never made it out alive so he decided he was going to make a paladin and he was going to think things out and he was going to play all like, you know, low key special and he was going to make sure he was aware and he was going to min max a little bit and he was going to make sure that everything was like chill and he was ready. So we fight through the entirety of this module and I run this over the span of months, including special like, uh, you know, weekend, like 24 hour, 12 hour, like gaming wow. sessions right where we're just having fun we were kids we were in high school guys were going out partying getting you know drunk you know doing all sorts of crazy stuff you know what me and the other kids were doing we were in my porch playing dnd rolling dice oh <laughs> yes <laughs> oh yes we were those guys and it's it's funny too because during the day we were in the gym too and, and <laughs> on the wrestling fields and working on cars and at night we were rolling dice when it was too dark to work on cars Hell yeah. they kind of looked at us funny <laughs> anyway so we get to the very end and this character who my, my one player who was like so psyched he was like it's at the very end we've got this last big character there's so much ramp up i've managed to to to, to verbally kung fu this massive grandiose stage and everything was awesome and he was like i've got you i'm gonna charge i'm gonna spirited charge i'm gonna power attack i'm gonna use smite i'm gonna use this that the other thing and i'm gonna use this and that the other thing and i go all right cool you're charging? He goes, yeah. I'm like, all right, cool. He uses Wish. I wish your back is broken. Oh, crack. Oh, man. And he falls on the ground. And the player paused and stared at me across the table. 
and the other players had to restrain him. <laughs> he across the table to try to come at me. And I looked at him and I was like, I thought you were done charging into combat, Hoss. <laughs> he was like, I'll have to kill you. That's awesome. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Jack, because uh, I wanted to uh, say something else. Uh, so I totally get the idea of wanting to tell a story and everything, but um, as I'm sure most of us are well aware, combat is the grindiest and time most time consuming part of D&D. But, um, and this might only apply to 50 specifically, but it's really hard to kill a character in, in 5e. Like It's really hard after 5th level. <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair. Um, but, you know, they have to go down, they have to either fail their saving throws or mm -hmm. get coup de grade, which you can just choose not to do. Uh, so I, I feel like being scared of uh, taking out a PC is it's causing the combat to be like kind of pointless like if your characters aren't actually trying to survive when they know combat's like meaningless because they're not going to die what's the point that's true um, so like I'm not afraid I, I should clarify I'm not afraid to uh, bring my PCs to zero Mm -hmm. because there's mm -hmm. still like a 90 percent chance they're gonna live like if anyone yeah. has any healing at all whatsoever they're fine well that's uh, that's a true. combat that's a combat um combat mechanics thing though some games are like right. that some games right are not. that's why i said it might only apply to 5e yeah but, yeah 5e is definitely that way i mean when you get to higher tiers you literally have to be attacked by gods to be killed you have to go through <laughs> 17 different encounters in order to get rid of all your resources so then maybe something can take you out yeah. so but the, but you know if you're looking at uh white wolf games if you're looking at world of darkness if you're looking at uh rifts as an example or you know there's a lot of other games out there where insta giving you can be a thing um mm -hmm. and so from my perspective i also agree with the idea that this is a story this is something mm -hmm. we're trying to tell as a, as a group and if if you can avoid it the unfair taken by surprise mm. crap they just died now they just have to start over from ground zero is isn't great especially for a streaming community if you have mm. we uh, dice tyrants we had two of our cast members die in the first season like three-fourths of the way through the first season of one of our shows <laughs> oh, I remember and that. immediately changed the entire show we had to rewrite new characters in we had to move to a different location all the gm story details are out the window because you know it just didn't make sense anymore for a lot of what happened so from this perspective, there's a lot more consideration. It's like a, it's like a television show. Yeah. What do we do when we want to kill off some of the most beloved characters ever? Because th th that circumstance, there's no way they could have survived that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, yeah. But, but again, on the you, other, uh, go ahead. Say, on the other hand, you're the DM. Keep you know, take them down. Keep it exciting. Keep that fear of death in them. But you know, then maybe you have an NPC that saves them or something like that. Yeah. Golden rule. You, you can also, yeah. You have golden ropes, but you have to you have to play it right. You got the balance. Yeah, for right? sure. Yeah, you've got the you've got the okay. They know I'm just gonna save them thing versus the is he gonna just let me die? Because I believe I see in his eyes that he's just gonna let me die. <laughs> That's I put yeah. the fear of my jamming in my character, my there players, you go. Perfect. quite often. So, yeah. so the story with Temple kind of leads into the way I feel about it now when I run games and when I'm when I'm playing story with people. Um. To be that, to have that moment go by, I had a, a friend of ours that used to play with us who took me to the side who was a little bit older and he put his arm around me and he goes, Jack, Jack, my friend, although what you did was completely hysterical, <laughs> what you've got to remember is that people are, delve and connect with these characters and there's something special to them. And it's a huge percentage of why people show up and play. Mm -hmm. If they don't, if they're not in love with the character, they're not going to be in love with your game, and they're not going to enjoy playing, and they're not going to want to come back. Yep. So That's so true. But and, and he there's... looked at me, and he goes, "Look at me, Jack. Look at me." And I'm like, "All right, all right, all right." What? And he goes, "If you're going to have to kill the character, if they do something that stupid, that's on them." But stupid. But stupid well. if something happens where it's a manner of of the dice rolling, and you can't figure your own way out, if you can't, um use some sort of smoke and mirrors and magic to make sure that your character doesn't go down try this 
and I'm like, all right, what you got, what you got? And he sits down with me and he tells me this huge grandiose story about how this mighty character gets felled by this massive demonic presence. And it was like this like epic tale. And he looks at me and he goes, if that was your character, did it really suck that much? Or is that a memory you're never going to forget? Mm. And I go, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. So it kind of it, it warped my, my, my sense of DMing. I may not intentionally kick your character, and it may suck when it happens, but we're immediately going to cut scene. We're going to go out for a smoke. We're going to grab a snack, and we come back. I'm going to tell this epic tale that mm. is forever going to m memorize or, 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 or cast yeah, into memorial. gold and memorialize this character for you. And That's when tight. we make that new character, you're going to remember all the cool stuff that happened with that character. And it's not going to be as big as a blow. It's going to be something cool that you want to try with your new character. The carrot before the stick, man. You got to, if, if somebody's going to go out and if they can go out in a heroic as manner as possible or as cool a manner as possible or saving somebody or even like ridiculously funny, yep. those things will often be taken as okay. That, yeah. that happened. It mm -hmm. sucks a lot. I miss that person, but it's okay. Yeah, exactly. And that's if awesome. it's something that's true to the character, then absolutely. You know, yeah. I, if I, I think about that actually quite a bit with, with our, you know, our campaigns is that if any of my characters were to die, as long as it was done in a manner that was consistent with my character, then I would be totally okay with it. You know, I, mm. I mean, yes, it would sting, but like, I would be okay with it because it would be consistent to who I perceive that character to be. So, mm. yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right. We did have another question um, from Dice Barbarian that came in before the break. So I want to make sure we get a chance to get to that. And that question is, uh, what is one trend, gimmick, or type of play in TTRPG streaming that is something you think is interesting? Hmm. One trend? Yeah, or gimmick, or style, or something like that. I know, it's a tough one. That's not a good question. Yeah. The the problem with the question for me is that since I started doing so many of these streams, I don't watch nearly enough of them anymore. <laughs> yeah. I used to I used to watch Roll Twenty, I used to watch Critical Role, I used to watch um uh that other one that nobody's gonna name anymore because Adam Cobell was on it. You know, a variety of different shows. Yeah. Uh, but now I I don't have the time for it. I watch my shows with my community and your guys' shows on occasion. So that's like basically yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would call it a trend, but one thing that I do, and it's something that we, we don't really do it on how, I mean, it, I shouldn't say we don't, we don't do it as much with the Pathfinder campaigns. It's done more with Neural Nexus. Um, and I see it on other channels. I, you know, we do it a little with the Dice Tyrant. I do it a little with the Dice Tyrants because my character's a jeans and t-shirt kind of girl anyway, um, <laughs> is like the cosplaying, the really kind of getting into the character in that regard. I feel like um, when I have the chance to do that, it kind of helps put me a little bit more in the mindset of who my character is. Um, but Did you yeah, think that it also kind of relaxes you a little bit as you're playing this character in front of the screen? It just feels like a little bit more bouncy. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would say relaxed. I mean, again, I'm just lucky in that in the character Claudia that that I do play. You know, she really is kind of a her her style of dress is kind of you know this low key casual. Um, would I love to get a leather jacket for her to wear sometime? Abs a freaking lootly. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I <laughs> um, but I just I just like it more not so much that it helps me relax, but I feel like it just helps me get into that character's mindset a little bit more. Yeah. I get that. Uh I think I have one. Uh and that is uh when every campaign has its token drinking contest. <laughs> oh man! It must be played by method acting. <laughs> yeah. That could be a good trend. We need to make sure we have that trend. Maybe, actually, maybe. maybe that's just because I grew up as a young Scottish man. But uh, <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> literally every time there has been some sort of drinking competition, or we're just in the bar, I will be. I will go pace for pace with my character. <laughs> Hell yeah! Just, just to like, this is like, okay, I got crit failed. Okay, that's two shots, I guess. <laughs> I feel like with that, like, 
as for a character, absolutely. But for a DM, it's a little more dangerous. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like on, <laughs> I, I can understand with it on shows uh, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But at home or with your friends, oh. that's I've done it like three times, and I I always regret it. But it's always great because then I get to forget it and watch it back later. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I've got a trend. I've got a trend. So, what do you all think about this common trend in TTRPG streamers? of commercializing things like Raid Shadow Legends and uh, Wendy's. <laughs> oh. Oh, 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 that was a shot. That was fire. <laughs> <laughs> I dodged that a little bit. Uh, I, that I mean, it is a trend. It's it a is. Trend. It is. It is a trend. I personally am not a huge fan of stuff like that, especially <clears throat> if it's, uh, you know, it's like, the Wendy's one, for example. Uh, I'm just not a huge fan of it anyway. Like, we all know who Wendy's are, like, is as a company. We all, you know, <laughs> that's a good point. Like, it was I really don't cringy. Need a, yeah, I just, I feel like that's just jumping on the bandwagon for the sake of jumping on the bandwagon. You know, it's not like they're this new company that's up and coming and, hey, we're going to, this is like our target market. Like, no, this is, this is to me, it just felt like, Oh, we're going to release this because now TTRPGs are cool, and mm-hmm, you want to mm-hmm. get in on that. Well, I mean, from oh, devil's, so- devil's advocate point, from my from my perspective here, is that TTRPGs have not been recognized for years as having real. They're just mm-hmm. kids' games or something like that, and now they're starting to be taken a little more seriously by the community. Um, so, what from that perspective, I can get behind the idea that wow, companies actually recognize us mm-hmm. as worth money to them, which means. It's becoming more legit. But I also am not the kind of person who could ever really sell his soul like that. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I couldn't do it personally, but I don't judge other people for doing so because, like, at the same time, as like doing this isn't free, there yeah. is cost involved. And if you're not making that money back, you know, it, it, I, I get there it. are there are other options, and maybe they're not oh, the most lucrative sure. ones, right? Because uh, yeah. one example is um, right now, I know that the producer for Zweihander is looking for people to stream their game, and they're potentially offering to give people a network to do that, or to assist them with that, or to pay them for the shows, right? Um, that kind of thing. It's a it's a group. It's a it's their own individual entity. They're trying to bolster up our own communities as is. I can get behind that 100. Um, percent But when it's a faceless like heartless corporation that is just force feeding money into society and destroy mm. I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about though. Tell us how you really feel, Ty. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> that would get the show canceled. <laughs> I think um, from a... I want to get out the flak and helmet. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't from bought my a... body armor yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an interesting thing because as a, as a freelance filmmaker, that's always kind of the dream to like get signed with or to get a big big production company behind your script or behind your idea and then but there's always that sort of like voice inside your head like no no, no i'm gonna i'm gonna be the one who's control this and i'm gonna be the one who's like like pushing this story forward so i don't know i think this is an interesting thing like i'm not saying i agree with what what happened because it was super cringy and super like oh this felt very sell outy um but as someone who struggles out in LA, if I'm not saying everyone struggles out in LA, but if as someone who struggles out in LA, if a big company is like, "Hey, here's X amount of money to rep this," I mean, you, you give that you give it that second thought of like, hmm, maybe absolutely, we, yeah, absolutely. It's like yeah. maybe we take the hit on this one, with yeah, creative freedoms, and then the next one because we it, now have a name, exactly becomes a yeah. Maybe maybe, maybe I'm alone on this one, and maybe you guys can fill me in a little more. But I don't know about any, like, other than the obvious, like, you know, cosplay and stuff like that. And I've heard the, the, the module that Wendy's handed out, <laughs> but I haven't heard any, any of the rest of this stuff. Maybe it's just me. Like, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't ring any bells. It doesn't, like, I don't, I don't think of gimmicks other than, you know, like, cosplay is cosplay. And you see that on some streams, you don't see it on others. And, mm-hmm. you know, some people, like, you know, they want the stream to, to feel like it's a bunch of friends getting around playing D&D. Mm-hmm. And some streams want you to see characters. And I get that. Mm-hmm. I understand that. Um, but I don't, I don't really see it as, like, a, as a gimmick or, or anything like that. I mean, maybe... Hey, I think I you're you're touching on a, a strong point here too. I think that the TTRPG streaming communities that are being developed, they're still new when it comes to media. 
So they're still trying to determine what the identity even is going to be. And every group kind of takes a little bit from here and there from some of the other individuals out there, what works, what doesn't. I think that over the course of the next like five, 10 years, we'll start seeing copycats because there's a formula now. <laughs> this is how you make your stream work. You put this video here, you say these things and you have these intros, you have these outros and you have all those mm -hmm. kinds of things at a formula level. But now I think it's still too too young to do that. So I, I kind of agree with you that there's not a lot of gimmicks. Yeah. But if everybody um, starts playing their games with puppets, I'll change my mind. <laughs> well, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, not puppets, puppets, by the way. I do like, I don't know if you call this a trend or whatever, but just like the incorporation of real life models and terrain more and more for like battlefields. Um, uh, obviously, that's not easy for a lot of people to do because they're either online or they don't have the sword or whatever. But I know RDM has created models out of like styrofoam and cardboard. And you know, it's like super cheap. It takes time, but it really adds another level to your to your experience. Well, that's that's an artistic craft right there, man. Yeah. Like straight up, that's people cool. are creating these things that people get to go play on, and I think they enhance the game experience a lot. I agree. For us uh, at the Dice Tyrants, we used Fantasy Grounds, so we we have to do everything remotely. You can't do that in person thing. Mm -hmm. But for my games, right. I create um, 3D isometric views, and then I create figurines for each character to play as that are like Final Fantasy characters. So nice. you can move them around on the map and stuff. It gives you a it's a similar experience, but not exactly right. the the you know genuine thing. I think that's my biggest regret about choosing to do a podcast and not a stream. It is a long time ago we decided to not use any sort of visual for, for when we were recording for the podcast. Nothing, nothing visual. Just to try to stay away from the oh I want to move here and hit that guy. We tried to just make it very like oh I would like to move. Like we we try to keep it more visual in our descriptions. So like seeing all these cool streams with like Dwarven Forge stuff or like home crafted like amazing trains, I'm just like, oh gosh, I'm just saying words and they're actually playing with cool things. <laughs> I, I miss that. Uh, but yeah. yeah. There are some people who can't theater the mind at all. Mm -hmm. There is no nothing that happens in their head when people start describing. They need to have some sort of visual reference. Mm -hmm. Some people it works great for, and that's that's why I think you actually get a discrepancy between individuals who listen to podcasts and those that watch the streams, mm -hmm. is because they're two oftentimes different types of people. Well, I was actually talking to someone about this the other day. It it is actually I I never like never really rep my podcast to people who are not already asking about it because like it is a it is a weird thing to like oh come listen to my D and D podcast because like it's yeah. it's. It is it is such a niche a niche thing, and if you're not like already wanting to do that, you're not gonna you're not gonna know what's going on. And like even if you are super into it, you're listening and you're like washing the dishes or cooking something. You zone out for like one second. You come back to like wait a minute, what? Wait, where are we? What's happening? Like it's it's a difficult it's a very difficult thing to theater of the mind in a podcast. A trend I recommend for all podcasts, for all streams, for everything: recap episodes. Just something that describes things that happened and then gives that mm -hmm. in a very digestible form. So if someone doesn't want to watch through a backlog of 100 episodes, they can say, this is what occurred. These are the main characters of interest. These are the, you know, big key po key moments. Kind of like checkpoints. Yeah. It's cool. I like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Something we do at the beginning of every episode before we start off is we do a uh, like a couple minute recap. If you notice, uh, every time we start up a show, We'll we'll do our intro and we'll say hi to everybody after we run our like opening cinematic, which is always awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll greet everybody, we'll thank everybody, we'll 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 assign our bonuses that we get for our characters from from our viewers. Which, by the way, thank you guys so much. Um, <laughs> and after we're done with all that, uh, we'll go through and each one of the cast members will roll a d20, and the lowest roll on the d20 has to give a recap, like a brief bullet point of what Ooh. happened last episode. I like that. Yeah, bullet, bullet points are good. I, I tend to, like, for my game for Silver Shield, I tend to do that myself. I'll say, this is what happened in the last episode. This is where we're at. These are where these people were. But we've we've started um, <laughs> we've started doing some strange things for our intros, because instead of doing the whole, hi, I'm this person, and I play this character, and this is who they are, because we've, we've had, you know, two seasons, whatever. It's like, we're now selling 
products that are fan that are fictional to I our viewers. I saw that on your stream the other night. That was amazing. Yeah, we're having behind the scenes uh, interviews with the cast that plays the characters in the show, and we're having <laughs> little skit stuff. Uh, you know, I'm a theater kid, so you know we got we've got these things going on now too. So our first it's like amazing. 15 minutes is almost always just crazy off the cuff nonsense. That's awesome. That yeah, that I got a good chuckle out of that when I saw that on your stream the other night. I was like, that is fantastic! Like, what a great idea! <laughs> <laughs> like, it, that's just like a like you said, you're a uh, theater person, and like coming from improv and stuff. There's always such such a rewarding moment of like getting the audience involved. Like, oh, I'm gonna yeah. do this for you. That that that's awesome. Um, one of the things that we had uh. Um, at uh, for so our Wednesday night stream just started. We've only had two episodes of it. Um, we were supposed to have one last night, life, blah blah blah. We didn't have it last night, so we've only had two episodes. But our premiere episode was on April Fool's Day. Um, and uh, so so. Our DM and a cast member, another cast member, Yacht's Twitch, uh, <laughs> remade our intro, <laughs> and they made it. I to, saw that. Oh. They made it to the Dawson's Creek opening theme. <laughs> <laughs> it was nice. amazing. Oh, they uh, <laughs> they cut. They took a you know a face. They cut out the face of everybody and they put it over the faces of all the characters in the intro and like just like in paint like wrote people's names in over the other. And it was. We were dying laughing. It was so amazing. funny. So it is hysterical. It is. It was, it was so was funny. funny. Yeah, <laughs> there's a clip of it pinned on my uh, on my Twitter account. If anybody wants to see it, it was priceless. I mean, how did you guys get away with that without getting in trouble with Twitch? I mean, that's <laughs> <No idea. laughs> I don't know, but yeah. Oh my god, it was it was hilarious. Um, so that was uh that was a good time. Um, yeah, we've had some funny stuff. Uh. You can know, i ask you, another question yeah go for it we were just we were talking about this a little while back about the killing um killing pcs and i think it was you Ty, you brought up something about uh golden ropes and not killing these extreme like, favorites and podcast favorites do you do you think they're like do you think that's something we should stop doing should nobody be safe or like should we should like Stream favorites and podcast favorites and all these like legendary characters should they be so, okay i think that there should always be a potential risk for danger it is a good idea if, you, if you're looking at this from a purely directorial point for a show for something right it is a good idea to show your viewers that there is risk that there is danger so having a character maimed or die is okay in that regard but at the same time um it's it's also very important to hold the idea that that death could be there just as strongly. Mm -hmm. So for my campaigns, I quite often put my characters in a position where it looks like they're going to die. So anybody that's watching it from home or that's even the characters that are playing it themselves have that adrenaline, right? That that moment where they're like, oh, oh crap, what's going to happen next? So a, a good GM can do that even when their their players are not actually in danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. Also, at the same time, uh, the whole idea of the stream or podcast favorite is kind of amorphous. It's like everyone has their own favorite character. Uh, that's like, point. Point. we've again, that's I think, the no no main character scenarios here, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, because we've I think pretty much every single character in our podcast, someone has said it's their character. Um. But yeah, so I, I just, like I just think of like Game of Thrones, where it's like everyone had their own favorite character, and everyone thought they could die at any point. Yeah, <laughs> right? character well, be yeah, yeah. You, you established that this was a, a violent place where bad things could happen, and then yeah. you had poor. characters that you didn't know if they're gonna. Poor, poor Boromir. <laughs> has he, has he survived a movie? Has Sean Bean survived? No. Yes. I don't think oh my gosh. Gosh. <laughs> it's, 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 No, no, no. It's a running gag that he actually did in an interview. 
uh, came forth and, and answered the question. He hasn't survived any of his like X amount movies. of movies, and it's all movies, a running gag yeah. with him. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's a television show where he stays alive, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's such a shame because I mean he's such a, he's a great actor and like yeah. the character the character he plays the characters he plays. Are amazing. I'm certain of it. Huh? <laughs> There's only the one I can think of, and that's uh, the Martian. But, <laughs> there you go. But um, well, yeah. to to kind of touch on that, I I don't think a character should be safe, and I think that I think that suspense adds something. I don't think that DMs, especially uh, in a podcast or in a stream setting, should give that immunity to their cat. I don't think mm. that's the case. I don't think you should ever let them know if you are protecting them in any way. Mm. They should never feel like they have immunity for sure. And I don't think that certain people I don't think immunity, I agree with you that I don't think immunity should be on the table. Maybe some protections, but not immunity. Something that that Mike did for our first like four or five levels, he looked at us and goes, "All right, so for the first four levels we've got two characters or we've got two players that have never game tabletop before. Mm. So your first four levels, you're going to be played with, you know, treated with kids' gloves. Mm. You'll get hurt, and if you do something really dumb, you could die. But for the most part, we're going to softball it a little bit, let you guys get used to the game and the system. And once you've got a cast of people that are used to it and that are playing the system and are a little stronger, gloves are off, baby. You know, <laughs> it's it. But Here if you go. again, I, I, I subscribe to the, if you're going to kill the character, especially in a show where you've got something to consider you've got merch you've got a fandom you've got um you've got ties between all these people and these like set set of characters one you've got to make sure that their characters in the backup that are going to be able to absorb and that are going to be able to get along with the cast like that mm-hmm. or there's going to have some sort of integration whether it be strife and, and conflict whatever the case is there's got to have that little that little bit that's going to be able to hook them back in and two if you're going to kill the character it's gotta be memorable it can't just be well the dude kind of slipped fell and pelled himself on his sword and <laughs> we're playing you know some nickelback in the background while we <laughs> 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 look, look at this so photograph <laughs> yep, exactly. nine times oh so, my gosh so uh touching on that point as well there there is some things that can help uh fledgling storytellers to kind of give that opinion or give that like one shots perfect one shots you can kill everybody it doesn't matter <laughs> it's a single game i i ran one called the last alarm recently where i had a crew of of uh four five, five. i can't remember because i'm super tired five five people they were facing <laughs> they were facing insurmountable odds and if they succeeded succeeding meant that in the main campaign positive things were going to happen for them and if they mm. failed negative things were going to happen in the campaign so it showed how dangerous my system was to the viewers if they watched that they could see how easy it is to potentially get murdered just straight out right and um th- that happened as well with uh quarter source uh, another ttrpg show that's out there not mine um in the first like i'd say first 20 30 episodes they had two tpks in it and then wow. they showed how dangerous the world was and then the game started ramping up and people played a lot longer and they were higher level D characters so they stopped dying so again that that does give you the idea this gm yeah they're gonna they're, they're not gonna pull punches they're gonna murder you mm. um so dice barbarian asks keeping this in mind should characters start at higher levels so they have more options uh for avoiding dpks and take some of the pressure off the dm no no nope. absolutely not you don't develop a character that way. I mean, if you're going to start a, a high-level story specifically, you now have this entire backstory that you never played through. You have no ties to that. It's it's disassociative. Never... Yeah. I generally I... agree, except for one shots. One shots, <laughs> yes. One shots yeah. again. They're they're yeah. always going to be a a different thing. I again, I said it before. I'll say it again. You make this this framework, this character background, this one page to three page to two page to three paragraph backstory about a character you get everything enveloped you get everything there but again the character doesn't start and doesn't develop a personality before that first dice roll yeah it develops as you're playing that's who your character is that's when you discover personally what is the make them tick as you're playing (laughs) that makes sense to me uh, I am okay with starting at level three, only because levels one and two are kind of bullshit. 
Sorry. Yeah. Five, like it came out. So I've, I haven't played many of this just since. But yeah. That that's D and D, man. There are other games out there that don't have that problem. Right. Think, yeah. No. Absolutely. I think that's the biggest takeaway I'm going to play take from this whole little thing tonight is. I am a, a noob when it comes to the amount of TTRPGs out there. Like you've mentioned, you guys have all mentioned like fifteen, and I'm like, fuck, I gotta, I gotta get out there. <laughs> there's, 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 as soon as you discover the the plethora of other games that exist, you start going, I couldn't tell this story in this system, but I can tell mm. it in this one because it's designed yeah. around that concept. It's designed around those ideas and those themes and those abilities that are in it. They're tied directly to this type of story. I want to. All right. Well, at this point, we have hit our time for the night. The <laughs> so, time. It, I know. Ooh, yes, exactly. I know. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you all again just to go around. Um, tell us where we can find you on the interwebs, and uh, and we will call it a night after that. So um, Cyclone Jack, where can we find you online? So you can find me over on twitch.tv slash Cyclone Jack. You can follow me on the Twitter at at c y k l zero n e you can find me on instagram at cyclone jack dot twitch you can find me on youtube at cyclone and uh thank you guys for all being here thank you Luna, for having me again yeah thanks for coming um ty hello everyone i'm ty burris <laughs> oh god <laughs> Anyway, his uh, lack of sleep is coming through. <laughs> I'm getting crazy. Oh no! I bring out the microphone now. Um. <laughs> so yes, you can catch me a lot of even star on DVR, Twitter, and Twitch, and over on YouTube. You have to search that one though, because I don't have the domain name uh, for any of my streaming content. And of course, I am a dice tyrant through and through. Catch us at uh, Twitch TV forward slash dice tyrants. We have games on Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursday. We play games. We don't do TP TTRPGs on Thursdays at the moment. We will be having a show similar to this uh, come back up soon. And um, we do one shots all the time. Come check us out. We have all kinds of cool content. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Doc, how about you? Uh, well, as the person who's probably the smallest of the bunch, uh, yeah, you can uh, probably, the obvious one is my uh, Twitter. It's the same as below, Dr. Dune, except there's a one at the end uh from because i'm kind of busy with a lot of stuff uh any streams will get announced there any videos i upload will be announced there pretty much everything you can find from my twitter and like i said um i'm very small uh i i'm probably probably the least well known of anyone here we have like two or three people maybe a stream and so it's it's nice if anyone it's a nice chill environment everyone wants to come hang out feel free to come and enjoy a drink and play some games i guess <laughs> Copy that. Awesome. Uh, Red. Uh, hi. Um, this is, I'm from Discount Dungeons. You can find my Twitter uh, at Red Shoe Dude underscore. Uh, you can find our podcast over at uh, Discount underscore DND. All of our links are there. Our podcast uh, drops every other Wednesday. Uh, next one, episode eight, goes up next week. Uh, our podcast is available on pretty much all major platforms. And uh, we have a Patreon now. So, yay. Cool. And David. Hey, yeah. Uh, so you can find me uh, personally at David Tilstra on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but more, I guess, more importantly, uh, you can find uh, my podcast or our podcast at uh, From Afar Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. I think we also have From Afar Podcast.com. And we, uh, we release our episodes every other Monday in our next episode, episode 31. Is it 31? It's 30. Episode 30 comes out this coming Monday. Be there or be square. Anyway. Right. <laughs> but seriously, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. This has been a, real, a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah this is awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. This this was great. This was um, you know, a really, really nice group of people to hang out with and spend some time with. And, and absolutely. Um, you know, we're super happy that uh <laughs> that you all were here. Um so uh again, this is the How I Nerd channel. We have streams on Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, um, which is Tabletop Tavern. Um, that has me and Cyclone Jack in it. Monday night is Neural Nexus Zero at 9 p.m. Eastern, which has Cyclone Jack and Dr. Dune in it. <laughs> uh, then we take Tuesdays off so we can breathe for a minute. And then Wednesday nights we have Tabletop Tavern 2, um, which I am in. 
Uh, and on Thursday nights, we are right here with Tales from the Tavern every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, we also uh, just started up a, a streaming team for anybody on Twitch um, who is maybe looking for a way to connect with other TTRPG stream communities. Um, and uh, we are um, we are the Storytellers Union. So if you're interested on that uh, and finding out more information about that, you can visit our website at howinerd.com. Um, also, you can find all of our information on um, YouTube as well if you want to check out back videos and things like that. Um, and we are going to go raid uh, another member of our stream team. This is a recent addition to the stream team. Indigo Chameleon is currently live, so we're going to go scope them out and go send them some love. So if you're a subscriber to the channel, drop those emotes, tell them where you're coming from, tell them all we said hi, and uh, thanks again for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, y'all. Bye bye. You're wonderful. Bye bye bye. You're awesome too. Yes, thank you, Howard. <laughs>